today we want to look at the two kinds of two kinds of sin two kinds of sin there are two kinds of sin that the bible talks about there are two kinds of sin but before we look at the two kinds of sins um, well, also, we need to look at what is sin. So, we'll look at what sin is. We'll also look at the law of sin, because sin has a law. Sin has a law. So, when you hear most preachers talk about sin, 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 most of, them, most of the time, they don't even understand what sin is. And sad to say, because many of the preachers don't even understand what sin is, they teach the wrong things. The wrong doctrine of sin and because they teach the wrong doctrine of sin many of the members receive this error and walk in the light of that error so we're going to look at the two kinds of sin but first of all like we said we're going to look at what sin is we're also going to look at the law of sin we're going to look at the fruits of sin the fruits of sin sin has fruits what what, what we mean by fruits we're looking at the results of sin. What are the results? Alright, these are the things we're going to look at. Alright. Sin has emotion. So we're going to look at the motion of sin. You see, these are the things we're going to look at. And then finally, we'll now look at the two kinds of sin. The first one, the first kind of sin is the sin unto death. And we're going to look at examples from the Old Testament down to the New. So that you can actually learn from the mistakes of others. So that you can put yourself in the position of advantage. And not make the mistakes others have made. So we are going to look at sin unto death. Because there is a sin unto death. So we are going to look at them expressly, exhaustively. And this will take us even down through a series. So we are going to have about maybe close to like four teachings on the two kinds of sins. I want to look at exhaustive examples, the errors, the mistakes. Because most of you are probably even making that mistake right now. You are even at the verge of one. And some of you are probably even in the middle of one. And then you wonder why God is very angry with you. You wonder why each time you pray, no answers to your prayers. As a matter of fact, the more you pray, the more problems you, the more you compound your problems. We're going to look at all of this. Because there is a sin unto death. And this will help you now understand why you see some Christians die. You begin to wonder, but he's a Christian. How come he died like this? How come he died? We're going to look at all of that. So that you no longer walk in the dark. The Lord wants to reveal these secrets to us. Then we're going to look at sin that is not unto death. That's the second kind of sin. So we're going, these are the two kinds of sin. The sins unto death, which is the first kind. And then the sin that is not unto death. But before we look at that... We want to look at what is sin. We want to look at what sin is. And so brothers and sisters, please hold your Bibles. Please look at your Bible so that you can see these things for yourself. So that it doesn't seem as though um, we're giving you something that is not there in the Bible. And sometimes when you hear some preachers preach, you wonder where they got their teachings from. And sometimes we always ask ourselves, is it from the same Bible we are also reading from? Some have even brought human, human experiences and made them doctrinal, supporting them with scriptures, with the wrong interpretations to it. And so these are the, the errors we want to correct so that you can no longer walk in the dark. Brothers and sisters, there is so much liberty in Christ. There is so much liberty in Christ. I'd like you to say that with me. Say, there is so much liberty in Christ. There is so much. There is so much liberty in Christ. But you see, how can you know this liberty? How can you even enjoy them? Because you see, there's so much liberty in Christ, and God wants you to enjoy this liberty. But how can you enjoy this liberty without knowledge? You need to know what this liberty is that the Lord has graciously granted you. So that you can know how to enjoy it. Because until you know your place, you can never take your place. 
And so God wants you to know your place so that you can take your place. And of course, for as many of you that are in this class, some of your initial theologies will be offended. So you can be sure, we guarantee this, so get ready. The revelations the Lord is going to give us will even offend some of your beliefs, your initial beliefs. Please, just don't get offended. It's just the truth of God's word. Amen. 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 And of course, um, there's room for questions and answers, please. All right, when we get to the question and answer segment, you can ask your question. Please, let, let's not interrupt, please. All right? Please. All right, so now, turn your Bibles, brothers and sisters. We said we are dealing on the two kinds of sins. Two kinds of sins. Like we said, we may not be able to cover everything in one class. We are going to have about close to like four classes to exhaustively deal with them. But turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. For the most part, when you ask Christians what is sin, they always want to tell you that sin is when you disobey God's command. Or they tell you when you are disobedient to God's instructions. And in as much as that sounds nice, it is not the complete truth. As nice as it sounds, as logical as it sounds, even as religious as it sounds, it still does not satisfy the divine requirements with reference to the New Testament life. And so these are the things we want to look at. What is sin? Now, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 14, verses 20, verses 23 says, Romans chapter 14, verses 23, it says, He that doubted is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Please mark that. For whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. So when they ask you what is sin, anything that you do that is not of faith is sin. So that you see a Christian womanizing, chasing women, or committing adultery, or maybe stealing. That is actually not even sin. Those are the results of sin. Drinking, smoking. The Bible never said drinking is even sin. And the Bible never said you shouldn't drink. Neither did the Bible say do not smoke. But you see, uh, we'll discuss that later on in details. Because you have some preachers who say um, the Bible never said you shouldn't smoke. Whereas it was never written in the Bible that you should not smoke. Neither was it even written that you should not drink. The only time the Bible makes reference to drinking was when it says that a king should not drink. A king should not take strong wine. That's the only time. But we'll discuss that um, later on. Alright? We'll discuss that later but then he says whatsoever is not of faith is sin whatsoever is not of faith is sin so if anything that you do is not of faith the bible says it is sin then if that is sin then we need to know what sin is don't you think so there is need for us to know what sin is if you are telling us that anything that we do that is not of faith is sin, then there is the need for us to know what sin is. What is this sin? What is sin? What makes sin? What makes sin? What makes sin? So these are the things we want to look at today. 
He sees here for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, brothers and sisters, there are seven Greek words that were used to that were used for sin. There were seven Greek words that were used for sin. And we're going to look at some of them. We are going to look at the seven words. The first one is Hamasha. Hamasha. Hamasha is spelled H A M A R T I A. Hamasha. H A M A R T I A. Now, why do we always go to the Greek? Most of the time, you hear some preachers make reference to the Greek. Because you see, the Bible was originally not written in English. And so these were actually the real words used, the original words used. So we want to look at them critically. Because he said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So what is sin then? Then the Bible says here, yeah, we now finally realize that there are seven Greek words for sin. So which means that it is not every part you read sin, sin, sin in the Bible that is actually talking about one thing. It's not referring to the same thing when you hear, when you see the word sin, sin, sin. I recall in the book of Genesis, when you talked about Genesis, go to Genesis chapter 4. Let's see something quickly. Then before we start looking at the Greek words. Genesis chapter 4. When Cain killed Abel, when Cain killed Abel, the Lord came to Cain and said to Cain, Genesis chapter 4. Are we there, please? He says, and Adam, from verses 1, Genesis chapter 4, from verses 1, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the fruits of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now, verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Please listen carefully. Cain was angry that God did not accept his offering. Then verse 6, the Lord, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrought? That means, why are you angry? And why is thy countenance falling? No, no, was the Lord is saying, why are you sad? You are angry and sad. You are looking very sad. Now look at verse 7. The Lord says, If thou didst well, shalt thou not be accepted? He's telling Cain, If you had done the right thing, I would have accepted it. What does that tell you? Cain actually knew the right thing to do, but he didn't do it. Now, many Christians, contrary to what they have always thought, they have always thought that um, this was the first time Cain and Abel would give God an offering. It's not true. They have been giving God offerings before. Don't forget, Cain was born before Abel. Now, see something even in verses 3. In verse 3, the Bible says, and in the process of time. What does it mean by in the process of time? In a period. So, which means that, that, that will let you know that that was not even the first time Cain has been giving God an offering. So, Cain knew exactly the kind of offering the Lord required from him. Which was the first fruit offering. But Cain gave God the general offering. Now, contrary to what most Christians think, they have also thought too as well that... Uh, they say because K 
Cain was a farmer, so he brought bad yams, bad, bad pineapples, bad fruits. The ones that were spoiled and wanted it to give to give to God. That was not the case. That was not the case. There was a specific offering that the Lord required from Cain. And Cain knew exactly what the Lord required. Because he has always been giving it to the Lord. But on this particular occasion, he refused. He decided to give God something else. Like most of you, when they tell you pay your tithe, you say, no, I want to split it. I want to split my tithe because I go to two fellowships. I will go to, I go to XYZ church. That's my church. But I also attend this. Like most of you, for instance, some of you may say, I go to XYZ church and then I attend Bible class. I want to send my tithe to Bible class. Please don't send your tithe to Bible class. Though. Take it to your church. Take it to your church. Take it to your church. Don't bring it to Bible class. If you are somebody who has no church, you have not been going to church, you don't have any church, then that's another matter. But you know you go to a particular church. And don't think we will not find out. We will know that you have a church you go to. Except you have not been going to a church. And there must be a justified reason for not going there. Then probably you cannot send your tithes. But then, aside that, take your tithes to your church. Now, we said all that to say this. There are most of you who always say that instead of giving my tithe to the pastor, I would rather go and buy things and give to the poor. You are not different from king. You are not different. In fact, that is even more trouble for you. Because there was a definite offering the Lord required, which was a first fruit offering. But Cain decided to give God an offering instead of the fourth fruit offering. First fruit offering. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing as good as doing what God specifically requires of you to do. Don't try to help God interpret it. God does not need your interpretation. You know, so there are some Christians who try to help God interpret scriptures. The Bible says no scripture is of any private interpretation. So why are you trying to interpret it anyhow? By saying that, oh, I will send my tithe to this church, then I will split it. Since I go to this two, I attend Bible class, and I go to XYZ church, I will split my tithe. The, if you do so, it is no longer tithe. It is now a contribution. I will be glad to collect the money so that we can go and buy more cakes for as many that are celebrating birthdays. Because the moment you split your tithe, it is no longer tithe anymore. It is no longer tithe anymore. Now, God required a specific offering from Cain. And Cain has been paying. Isn't that amazing? You have some Christians. They have been paying their tithe. Paying their tithe. All of a sudden, they just got angry one day and said, they got angry one day and said, I'm no longer paying tithe anymore. I don't want to pay tithe anymore. Because one person, one person that, that made himself or herself available for Satan to use came to came your way and indoctrinated your mind, gave you the wrong teachings about Titan, and then you said, it's the pastor, can't you see, he's using our Titan to pay his rent, can't you see, he just bought a jeep, his daughter is even going to Penn State University, very expensive university, his son is, is in Yale University, and then you now say, ah, and my own children are still struggling through community college, say, this pastor must be eating our money, oh. Then you are not different from Cain. And yet you will be the one to say, Ah, Cain was very wicked. He did a very wicked thing. He killed Abel. No, you are, not, you are not even different. You are even worse. You are even worse than Cain. Because God himself cannot talk to you. God, God spoke to Cain. But for you, God cannot talk to you. Can't you see you? Yet you are saying, Cain, Cain killed Abel. Ah, Cain, Cain must have been very wicked. Cain must have been very, very wicked. Yet you are even worse than Cain because you even have the Holy Spirit and you are using the, the anointing upon your life to do evil. Cain did not even have the anointing in his life to do right. But you, you have the anointing which was supposed to teach you the right way to go. You are using your anointing to do evil. Then you are worse than Cain. Then you are not different from Lucifer because Lucifer was anointed, was also anointed and then he used his anointing, he corrupted his anointing and started using his anointing to do evil. But Cain did not even have any anointing. Now, something, brothers and sisters, I want to make you see here. I, I don't know why the Spirit of God is saying that to most of us here. Maybe there are some of you who are still splitting airs about Titan. Now, verses 5. The Bible says, And unto Cain and to his offering 
he had no respect. So God indeed recognized that it was an offering Cain was bringing to him. But God never had any respect for it because what Cain brought to the Lord was not what the Lord requested of him. It's like me coming to your home. It's like us visiting your home and then you ask, so, uh, then you ask, what do you want? And I tell you, please, can I have a glass of water? And then you go and bring me juice. Even if juice is sweet, that is not what I want. And if you do that, and if you cause me to still drink that juice, you have disrespected my person. And then you begin to wonder why the next time you invite me to, invited me to your house, the next time you invite me to your house, I don't, I don't want to come. The reason why I will not come is that anytime I make a request, you will not give me what I want. And the same thing goes between husbands and wives too. Most of you are wives here. Yeah. Most of you are wives. Your husband makes a particular request. I want to eat yam and stew today. Or maybe yam and egg. Or beans and pottage. Or whatever. Or beans and egg. And please put plenty, plenty pepper. The wife says, no, let's not, I don't want to, I don't want you to eat beans. The man says that is what he wants to eat. You say, no, I think you should eat rice. Eat rice and chicken now. Just manage it. You are not even different from king. And then tomorrow they say, how many of you honor your husband? You lift your hand. Your husband will just be looking at you and say, see, sister. See, see, sister. Because your husband does not want to embarrass you in church, in public. He'll just be looking at you. They'll say, oh, guys, is it true? You say, hmm, praise God. He cannot even say yes. He just, hmm, he cannot even say yes. Because he knows you dishonor him. He says, put pepper in the food. You say, no, pepper is too much. I think you should eat more tomatoes. And uh, you know, I'm a nurse. Medically, you need to eat more tomatoes. <laughs> See you. Then later, you say you honor your husband. Then you are wondering why another lady outside is taking, taking advantage of your husband. Your husband is giving her more attention. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake. A, make no mistakes. A man will always give attention to the one who honors him. That's just the truth. Now, verses 6. And the Lord said, Verses 5 again, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? And why is thy countenance falling? Why are you so sad? He said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou, do, if thou doest not well. Now, look at the next word. He said, Sin. Light at the door. Sin. Light at the door. Please mark that word sin there. That's the reason why we went through all that we went through concerning Cain. The Lord actually, the word, the English language this translates that word to be sin. But that word sin there in the original Hebrew text does not really mean sin. Does not mean sin. Not does not really mean sin. No, does not mean sin. What he meant by sin there, when he says sin, he was referring to sheep. Sacrifice. The lamb for sacrifice. There's always a lamb for sacrifice for the atonement of sins. And so look at what the Lord said there. He said, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. Can't you see it? He's giving personality to, to that sin. Shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. He's talking about sheep. Cattle. Cattle for sacrifice. That's what the Lord is referring to. When you see that word sin there. Now, it doesn't matter what a preacher must have preached out of that context. To say, you see, even the sin, you shall have rule over sin. No, you shall rule over sin. That's not what he's talking about here when he says sin light at the door. He's talking about the sheep, the lamb for sacrifice. Quickly, in other words, what, what God was saying to Cain is that quickly do what is right and, and make me happy. Kill a, kill a sacrifice and appease me so that I can forgive you for what you just did. For dishonoring me by giving me the wrong sacrifice. Then go and do the right sacrifice. Now, instead of Cain to do that, he didn't. He rather went further to go and kill his brother Abel. Now, would you call Abel the sin that he said was by the door? No. Abel was not supposed to be a sacrifice. And Cain knew exactly what the Lord was telling him. Cain knew exactly what the Lord was telling him. 
This was the reason why the Lord placed a mark on him and said he was going to be a vagabond in life. That was not God's plan for his life. So, like you see that word sin there, it means sheep. S-H-E-E-P, sheep. Lamp that you keep for sacrifice. That's what he refers to there when he uses the word sin, light at the door. So it is not all the time that you read, we, we showed you that to make you understand that it is not all the time you read the word sin that is actually referring to sin as to doing what is wrong. Don't forget, Cain had already sinned by even dishonoring God through his sacrifice. So that was already sin. But then the Lord now says, sin light at the door and his desires shall be at your beck and call. You shall rule over it. So what is he trying to say? He's talking about sheep, the lamb for sacrifice. That's all there that he's talking about. But let, let's go back again now to the Greek, seven Greek words used for sin in scripture. I hope you are learning something. Amen. Praise God. All right. Now, the first word for sin in the Greek is hamasha. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. And Hamasha, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, Hamasha, Hamasha. And Hamasha in the Greek means to miss the mark, to miss the mark, mark, M-A-R-K, to miss it. When you miss the mark, to miss the mark, you know, it gives us a picture of an archer. Like archery, those who shoot bow and arrow. You know, they always have a mark, a target that they shoot the arrow towards. True or false? True. Right? Now, that when you miss, when you miss that target, when you miss that target, the Greek word is what? Hamasha. So they will say you have missed the mark. In other words, they will tell you you have sinned. You understand? Now, does it mean that the man who shot the the who shot the arrow committed adultery. No. What it just means is that it says you have just missed the mark. That will even help us understand why Paul was saying, I was I'm pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. It says Hamasha. And uh, this particular word, Hamasha, happens to be the general word that. Uh, Commonly used word for sin, even in the Bible, and it was used 221 times in scriptures. It was used 221 times in the Bible. The word Hamasha. It is one of the words commonly used in scripture. It's one of the words commonly used in scripture. And it was used 221 times in scripture. Alright. And um Uh, let, let's see a particular example of that word Hamasha in the Bible turn to Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 thank you Holy Spirit Thank you, Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let's see it. Say thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's say it again. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1. It says, It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also sorry he said wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and did you notice he said the sin the sin he didn't say every weight and sin he says every weight and what the sin he addresses it with a definite article the sin the sin he says let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Do, do, do you understand? He said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we are actually running a race 
as Christians in our individual lives. Everyone has his own track that he or she is running on. And one of the mistakes we have, we make as Christians, is that you find too many Christians running on the tracks of others, leaving their own tracks to go and run on another person's track. And so by running out of your track into another person's track, you are blocking the other person from running as he or she should run. And the unfortunate thing is that many Christians do not know that that is how they are living their lives. They are even making others... They are hindering others from running their race on their track. Brothers and sisters, this is the reason why as a Christian, learn to mind your business. Learn to mind your business. Because the Christian work is a personal work. If nobody brings a matter to you, don't go into it. If you are not invited into a matter, don't get involved. And just because you see a Christian, Doing something that you think is wrong can even hinder you and may not even hinder him. And then you begin to wonder why God is blessing that person and you that seems to be so-called self-righteous, you are not really enjoying the blessings. Because what you are actually looking at as seen in the life of another person may not even be seen in the sight of God. He says, Hamasha. To miss the mark. Don't miss that mark. Don't miss the mark. Run your race. Run your race. Don't drift from your, from your own track into another person's track because you will hinder that person. And there are many Christians who do that. They go, they start, this thing is wrong. I want to tell you, the Bible says, it's sin is sin. Sin is sin. Which one is sin is sin? Which one is sin is sin? And you hear many Christians say that thing. There is no such thing as small sin, big sin. Okay, so which one? Who made you an umpire? Who made you a supervisor of another person's Christian's life? Who made you the only person who is qualified to correct a believer is his leader. Is his pastor or leader. Maybe a house fellowship leader. That's the only person that is qualified. But another fellow Christian coming to tell you you are wrong, no, that person has no right to do so. He's not authorized by God to do so. No person. The only person who can correct others. And brothers and sisters, sad to say, there are many pastors, just because, you know, <laughs> uh, um, Osi has been a victim to so many, really. You know, because um, Ozzy is a Ozzy is a very young boy. Ozzy is a very young boy. You know, Ozzy is very young. So, so, so sometimes there are some ministers who try to use age to look at you and then they gauge you. And so you find some of them even saying, "I will adopt you as my spiritual son. I will call you as my spirit. I will be I will be your spiritual mother." And sometimes when I hear those things, they make me laugh. I say, "Look at." We don't even run the vision. We don't run the same vision. You don't know what, what God told us to do in ministry. You say you want to be my spiritual father. I should be the one to even say I want to even submit to you. Not you willingly say I want to adopt you. And that is what many Christians do. Many ministers make that error. They look at somebody and say, just because somebody is listening to you, or somebody pays attention, listens to you, honors you, always even almost prostrating before you, does not mean the person is a spiritual son. Because you were not there when God was giving him direction. And too many ministers make that mistake. And so one day when they call the person for a meeting and the person refused to come, they say, I'm your spiritual father. Do you know who I am? Who made you a spiritual father? Who told you? Who told you? Who told you you are a spiritual father? You said it with your mouth. God never told you. And then you become angry with the person. You say, he does not honor me. So they will do it to you in ministry. I will curse you. I will curse you. Look at you, a minister. First of all, you don't even know what God told him. Brothers and sisters, I've met many ministers. With humility in the Holy Spirit, we say this. I've met many ministers, pastors. Some of them are even gray-headed. Who have said to me they want to submit to me for me to be their spiritual father and i've always shouted no please don't do it because for me it, it sounds very very heavy for me to say me you want to submit to me and it's for some of them they sincerely mean it at least i've met some 
At least I can speak for one who sincerely he was begging me. I said, Sir, just be my friend. We are friends. An elderly man, he said, No, he's a pastor. He said, I want to submit to you. I want you to be my spiritual head. I said, Ah, Oga, you are my friend. I appreciate you as my friend. Because some people, not for him now, but there are some people who use that as traps. Some people use that as a trap. And I've had many people who have said that to me. You are my spiritual son. I can tell you, and just be laughing. You know, you know, we are always laughing. And sometimes I wonder. I say, look, you don't, you were not there when God called me. You were not there when God called me. You don't know what the Lord said to me. How come you want to be the one to give me direction? Let me even be the one to come to you and say, I want to submit to you. And for most of you, don't get deceived. When you even hear somebody call you, mommy, 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 uh, I'm your spiritual daughter. It doesn't mean you are, you are a spiritual mother. Don't get deceived. Don't get deceived by that. So if anybody's coming and say, I want to make Sister Emma my spiritual mother. Sister Emma, don't get deceived by that. Did God tell you that you are a spiritual mother? And it's amazing. Where do, where do they even get all these things from? It's not even in the Bible. <laughs> In quotes, now it's not even in the Bible. I'm your spiritual mother, I'm your spiritual father, I adopt you. If you even look at, even when Paul used that expression, he could say it for Timothy because he was the one who trained Timothy. He trained him. And as a matter of fact, even when he was talking about being a spiritual father over Timothy, he still acknowledged Timothy's mother and his grandmother for giving Timothy the right foundation. He never, 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 never abused that. He recognized it and appreciated it. He acknowledged it. But you, you don't know where we are coming from in ministry. You don't know who trained us in ministry. You don't know the things we know. You don't know the vision that the Lord has given us. You say, I want to be your spiritual mother or spiritual father. Just because you are older than Osi. Just because you even have children who are far older than Osi. That is not how it is done. That is not how it is done. And many people use that to even... Some, some, people, some ministers have even used that as witchcraft to put some, some young ministers under them to frustrate the grace upon their lives. Because these so-called senior ministers feel threatened. They feel threatened that these young ones will assign them. It shouldn't be. And if you are a minister and that is what you do, that's no ministry, that's witchcraft. That's no ministry. That's witchcraft. God is not the author of confusion. Brothers and sisters, if we can learn, if we willingly accept to do it God's way, who will not have problems? Who will not have problems? So people are trying to fight over titles. It is not necessary. If the Lord does not give you a title, don't fight about it. Don't fuss about it. Don't make an issue. Whether you were the one that started the fellowship or started the Bible class or started your church, you were the one that even laid the blocks, they don't give you anything, what does it matter? God has recognized you. What does it matter? And that's all you need. That's all you need. He says, run your race. Don't drift from your track into another man's track. Hamasha. Hamasha. Don't miss the mark. Don't miss the mark. And if brothers and sisters can learn to understand this, if brothers and sisters can learn to understand this and acknowledge it in simplicity and in reality, they will not have problems. They will not have problems. There is nothing worth fighting for. Hamasha, you have your own race. And brothers and sisters, you know that even in the relay race, either 100 meters, 200 meters, 4 by 400 meters, 1,000 meters, 1,500 marathon, you know. Let's even look at the 100 meters. That's even the one most of us are familiar with. Even in the 100 meters, no matter how fast you are, if you jump into another man's track, you're automatically disqualified. True or false? True. You're automatically disqualified. So why are you trying to nose into another Christian's life? Do you know what God told him? Hey, I saw that pastor sleeping with a woman in church. Why don't you just mind your business? Why don't you just mind your business? Hamasha, don't miss the mark here. 
You don't know whether it is even part of the hurdles. You know there are races they call hurdles. 100 meters hurdles. You know you have that. And so you find the person running, jumping over a particular hurdle. Right? He's still running. He's still running fast. You don't even know. Maybe that is... For him, he is to run a hurdle race in life. Why for you, you are just to run a straight 100 meters. And that thing that he's probably committing is probably one of the hurdles he has to jump and overcome in his life. And with that understanding, it will even help you to even pray for him rather than criticize him. The Lord says we should stop. We will continue in the evening. Let's bless his name. Let's bless his name. Let's go so Yes, See practice go so practice it is because master to God. Master to the great God. Bless his name. Bless his name. So practice it is. So practice it is. Brother Kamas go so practice it is. Master practice it is because. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. We'll continue in the evening session. Um, is there any one you know you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life? You are not born again. But you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You want to be born again. So that you can actually run your race in earnest. Is there any person? Is there any person? If there's any person, please let us know by saying I. I. Uh, uh, Alright, brothers and sisters. Um, in the absence of no such one, um, eh, all right. Let's let's go to our questions and answers segment. Please tell us your name and where you are calling from. Please tell us your name and where you are calling from if you have any question. All right. What's your name, sir? Hello? Hello? What's your name, sir? Brother Richard. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, yes, this is my question. This, when I'm in, I go to school, um, I go to college, right? And there's this one girl, she's always, like, um, acting as if she's, um, she's righteous in the sense where she doesn't run in her own race. Yeah, you see, the thing is this: uh, Is she born? Is the lady born again herself? Is she a Christian? Is she born again? I don't even know if she's born again. Uh -huh, so that's one thing. Uh, so, but the thing is this: Is she? Um, one of the ways to help her is for you to even just mind your own business and ignore her. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> yes. Yes. That—that's just the truth. So that she can learn from you. You know, when 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 you when you are dealing with somebody who is always making noise. Always troubling. When everybody keeps quiet, he will also learn to keep quiet too. When he discover nobody is talking, he, he or she will be so embarrassed to keep quiet. It may take a while, but they will surely keep quiet. You understand? You understand? Sometimes we always think that um, we will learn from others. No, don't forget, people are also learning from you too. And that is why the Lord is teaching us this, Brother Oche. So you find out that you notice that this lady is always in your business. All right, so now that the Lord is giving us these teachings, we are all learning together, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Brother Yes, so as the Lord is teaching us, you just mind your own business and enjoy the liberty of the Spirit of God that the Lord has given you in your life. So she's, drif she's di drifting from her own track into yours or into another person's own. Already, that will even let you know that she's automatically disqualified. The only time she can run perfectly to get a reward is when she goes back to her own track. You understand? And she does that. You know, people who, who run from their own tracks, who trail, who, who derail from their own track into other people's track, do, when they do that, it hinders you, and then you also find yourself moving into another person's track. So what you are going to do is not to even give that room. You just maintain your focus. Because there is nothing as frustrating as being disqualified. 
And you wouldn't want that at all. You understand? Yeah, so no matter how fast the person is, like what she's doing now, trying to say that uh, criticizing other Christians, acting as though she's better, she's trying to criticize them. No matter how good she tries to do that, no matter how good she claims she is, the very fact that she has drifted into another person's track, she's automatically disqualified. It doesn't matter how fast she is in life. And that's why people like that. And you know, the thing is this, they probably may not even know. That's the amazing thing. They probably may not even know. Because the truth of the matter is that if they had even heard what the Lord is revealing to us now, they will actually listen and then make adjustments. You see, people do what they do because of the knowledge that they have. You understand? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Mm. Okay, have we answered your question, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. God bless you. All right, next question. This is Keisha uh, from Georgia. Okay, good. Well, How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Um, my question is, how do you know that you're living on your own lane? How do you know you're living on your own purpose so you don't miss your destiny? Okay, fine. You see, that... Okay. Is that all? Is that the question? Sorry? Is that the question? Yeah, that, that's the question. Okay, fine. Yeah. How do you know you are living on your own lane? Yes, by actually studying the Word of God and knowing what God wants you to do for yourself. Okay, now let's go to second. Um. First Timothy. Let's go to First Timothy chapter four. Let's see how. First, see. Let's see how. Sister Kisha, you you read for us. You read for us verses fifteen and sixteen. Okay. First Timothy chapter four. You say. Yes. Verse fifteen and sixteen. Yes. One five one six. Right. Yes. Go ahead. One five and one six. Okay. First Timothy chapter four verses fifteen to sixteen. Chapter fifteen. Meditate upon these things. Give yourself holy to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Chapter sixteen. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt love both save thyself and them that hear thee. Did you see that? He said, Take heed yes. unto thyself and to the doctrine. And as like what you are doing right now, and what most of many of you are doing right now, even in the Bible class. See, you are studying the word, right? Yes. Yeah, is everybody studying the people who are always troubling you, are they studying it with you? No. I, hear you. I said, okay, those those that are always in your business, are they are they in this class now with you? Yes, I bet not. Okay, fine. So they are not. So guess what? Now, the very fact that you are studying the word of God and you are taking heed unto his instruction, even in the Bible class, it will even help you know how to run your race. And that is what you're doing right now. Do you know even by spending time with the Lord, attending the class is part of the race they are running? Okay. Yes. And the more you give more attention to it, the more you give more attention to it, and you you focus on it, the more you always be in your business. Because you see, you you'll be too consumed, you'll be too consumed in the things of God to look at what another person is doing. Because one thing that God will always do in the life of a Christian is to tell you how to spend your, how to use your time wisely. How, how to make the maximum use of your time. Alright? And so that is what he's doing. Yeah. So you find out that all those petty gossips, I, remember before you could have been somewhere doing something, right? You could have been somewhere doing yeah. something. Okay, but now, even they are amazed now that they hardly see you. The places you were always fond of going, they are even amazed now they don't see you all the time. Sometimes they are even calling you, is everything alright? 
you know are you okay ah uh, we, we didn't even see you the last time and all that what is the matter and all that see you are running your race see now this is different from when you try to call someone to know how the person is doing it's a different matter but we're looking at uh, people who try to spy on you so that they can have something to go and talk about see they are missing the mark and that is what many christians are engaged with and satan even encourages them to do that unknowingly can you see that now turn your bibles to philippians chapter 3 let's see something philippians chapter 3 oh. philippians chapter 3 So by giving time to the word of God, studying the word of God, you are actually, you are actually, Philippians chapter 4, let's see something about the life of Paul. Philippians chapter 3, sorry. Philippians chapter 3, please can you read for us? Read verses 12. We are going to verses 14, but let's see something in verses 12. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not as though, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may. Apprehended that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Did you see that? He says, Not that I'm perfect to have apprehended that which I want to apprehend. He said, He himself is also working his out for himself. You know, sometimes we always we are easily quick to thinking that Paul was just a perfect man, he lived a perfect life. Even when he became a Christian. No, Paul is saying that he said, Not as though I have or I had already attained. Either we're, either we're already perfect. So Paul was saying, I'm not even as perfect as you think. But I follow after. Did you see that? Following after who? Jesus now. He said, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, there's a reason why Jesus brought me into this kingdom. And Paul was an apostle sent to the Jews. He said, I'm even trying to attain that purpose. That apostleship. The purpose for which I was sent to the Gentiles, sorry. Paul was an apostle sent to the Gentiles. So the purpose for which he was sent to the Gentiles, he said he's trying to attain that thing. He said, I'm not even there myself. So does it mean that you will not make mistakes? Of course you will make mistakes. You've already made mistakes, sir, even before today's class. And the Lord did not even say you will still not make mistakes. Now look at verses 13. Can you read for us, Sister Kisha? Okay. Brethren, I count that myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Did you see that? He said, Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What did he say there? He said, forgetting those things which are behind. Do you know, many Christians do not forget the past many he said forgetting those things paul says he forgot he said sure enough i made mistakes he said but one of the ways in order for me to attain that thing that the lord wants me to attain i always forgot them i kept them i left i forgot them i chose not to remember them because that is what satan wants to do if he can get you into the arena of always remembering your past mistakes then he has you Did you see that? That's what called sin conscious, right? Yes. The, sin, the okay. consciousness of sin. Paul says, no, forget it. Yes, you have... Uh, yes, maybe like a woman. You were married, yes. You call yourself a Christian. You mistake, you, you, somehow, some way, you ended up having an extramarital affair. Yes, you were a Christian. You made mistakes. And you ended up sleeping with the man. Yes, he said, forget those things that are behind. Press on. Keep running. Those were the obstacles. Keep running. He said, but one of the ways that I... See, Paul is telling us the secret why he succeeded. Paul is telling us the secret. He said, the reason why he succeeded 
was because he was always forgetting the mistakes of the past. Forgetting those things. He was always forgetting them. He said, forgetting those things that are behind. And don't, what, what, what did he say? He said, the, for me to forget, he said, in order for me to reach forth unto those things which are before me, I needed to forget those things that are behind me. Many of you desire a glorious future, but you are still living in your past. The Lord says, forget it. Put it aside. Keep running. People will say, and you call yourself a Christian. They say, eh, yes, I'm a Christian. Most of you, your husband even criticizes you and accuses you that way. Look at you. Last time you talked to me anyhow. And you call yourself a Christian. Yes. Uh-uh. Yes. The Bible says, forget those things. I should press towards the mark. Yes, I agree. I made that mistake. It was not intentional. But I agree. I acknowledge my fault. I plead guilty that I made that mistake. Hey, and you call yourself a Christian. I'm still a Christian. What, what do you think? Why do you think you are still a Christian? You are deceiving yourself. No, sir, I'm still a Christian because you were not the one that died for me on the cross. It was Jesus who did. It was Jesus that died for me on the cross. So, guy, okay, you were not the one that died for me. With due respect, I say this. Maybe it's your husband that is telling you. And you call yourself a Christian. You say, okay, with due respect, you're my husband. I don't know you. But you were not the one that died for me on the cross. The best you can do for me is to be me a husband. You're saying it with respect. Maybe your boss is telling you. And you call yourself a Christian. Look at you. He says, sir, yes, sir, with due respect, sir. I remember I was working in the, when I was working in the bank in, in Nigeria, in my country. Uh, my boss had, uh, he said to me he had a problem with me, so I said to him, solve it. If you have a problem with me, then go and solve it. So he went to report, to report me to our head of department, and our head of department called us into his office. And he, my, our head of department asked me, Ozi, so what is the matter? Why are you having problems with Mr. Daly? That's his name then, Mr. Daly. So, I said to my, my head of the family, we said to him, I said, sir, he said to me he had a problem with me. So I said to him to solve it. That's all I said. After all, every problem needs what? Solution. So he said he has a problem with me. So I told him, solve it. And then, Mr. Daly started yelling. He said, my boss then, the head of the department, his name is Mr. Ife. So we use this expression, Oga Ife. So he said, Oga Ife, you see what I'm telling you? you? See what I'm telling you? This guy is too arrogant. He's too arrogant. He's too arrogant. So I said to him, sir, don't ever tell me I'm arrogant. He said, why shouldn't I tell you you're, you're arrogant? I said, because you don't know where I'm coming from. I said, I'm not arrogant. I'm only confident about life. You told me you had a problem with me. I told you to solve it. That's all. He said, look at you, and you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a pastor. You call yourself, because then we were coordinating a, a fellowship in the bank. So he said, you call yourself a pastor. Look at you, you call yourself a pastor. I said, Mr. Daly, it's amazing that I was just minding my own business when the Lord said we should coordinate a fellowship. I said, ah, Mr. Daly, moreover, you were not the one that died for me on the cross. It was Jesus that died for me on the cross. And I never told you I was qualified for it, but he chose me. So... Uh, that I call myself a pastor, well, talk to him then, query him, query the one who called me. And my head of department just started laughing, he said, let's go back to work, you know. And then at the end of the day, this same Mr. Delay became my very, very good friend, very, very good friend. Brothers and sisters, even in the process of time, when I was preparing for my professional exams then, he was the one who even assisted me with books, he became a very good friend to me. Because when he had crisis later on within the bank, um, he was always coming to meet us for prayer. You know, brothers and sisters, even those people who are criticizing you now, they will still come and meet you for prayer soon. Even that your husband who is telling you, you call yourself a Christian, this and that. Don't worry, when there's a matter, he will say, come and pray, oh, there's a matter. And that's how Mr. Daly became my very good friend. And then he now switched into, because I was in investment banking, he was in commercial. We were both in investment banking before he went to commercial banking. And I was a big corporate banking. So I was happy for him when he switched. And I was so grateful. But we became very close friends. Indeed, he also helped me too in between. But I, I'm trying to tell you that the reason for this story is to tell you that even those who even try to criticize you or compartmentalize you, telling you you call yourself a Christian, you know, they use that, Satan uses that to make some people feel inferior. That their Christian life is not original. 
It doesn't matter what they think. They say you call yourself a Christian and, say, and you are still wearing lipstick. Wear it the more. Say, brother, <laughs> that means you really like me. Oh. Brothers and sisters, you see, the problem with many Christians is that they don't even always have the right answers to give these people. One thing I learned from my pastor that I lived with for many years, he was always telling me, he said, oh, see, don't ever let anybody give you the last word. Always be the one to give the last word. Don't ever let anyone give you the last word. He said, most of the time, the last word they always give is always in the negative. And it torments you, it affects you the most. So when somebody comes and says he wants to bang the phone on you, he wants to give you the last word, say, hold on, 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 hold on. Be the one to give the last word. Too many Christians are too afraid. Never be afraid. This Christian life is real. It is not a child's play. So it says here, he says you're forgetting those things that are behind. So when you see people accusing you of your past, tell them, look. You know, I remember I, in, the, in the ministry I was part of, back home in my country, we had leaders meeting one day. We had leaders meeting. We normally hold leaders meeting, I think on, I can't recall the day now, but we normally go for leaders meeting. And um, at the leaders meeting, our pastor was sitting. And then um, there was, I think there was a project we were working on. And the pastor... So everybody was expressing opinion. And then for me, I had the contrary opinion to what everybody said. <laughs> you know? And, um, and that actually cost me a lot in ministry. I was always disagreeing with what many people actually agreed with. So sometimes I begin to wonder, hey, do you people still read the same Bible that we are reading? You know, sometimes. But I didn't know the Lord was preparing us for this work. You know? But I recall, I, I disagreed with one of the leaders. And this leader, this particular leader, was somebody I honored and I looked up to, and I still honor him. And um, he was somebody that I had the privilege of visiting his home. He had invited me on a few occasions to his home, lovely home. We have eaten even from the same plate. But we were in this meeting, and, um, you know, because of friendship between both of us, he knew my background. He knew the fact that when I was in the university, I was a member of a fraternity. I was once a, fratern I was once a member of a secret fraternity, uh, a court group called the Paris Confraternity back in my country. And so he knew that very well. And I was amazed at the leaders meeting. He brought it up. And of course, he knew that um, I was also kind of an activist too. There was this element of activism in me. And I was amazed at the leaders meeting just because I had a contrary opinion to what he said and what so many said. He stood up and said, oh, see, stop this, stop this. Stop this. Don't bring your secret court society thing into this place. Don't bring your... I was amazed he said that. And interestingly, so many who never knew he was once a court boy headed for the first time. And he thought that that would actually make me embarrassed. This was a very close friend. He's still a very good friend. I still honor him to this very day. I hold no grudge against him. I'm saying this in Christian love. I hold no grudge against him. And I recall I said to him, his name is Brother Patrick. He's not a pastor. I said, Pastor Patrick. Then, Brother Patrick. So I said, Brother Patrick, it is true I was a secret court member. And as a, as a matter of fact, I was the high priest. I was in charge of initiation. And true I was. I said to him, I said, I, I, so I started giving him more details. I said, so my pastor was saying, oh, I said, Pastor, hold on, sir. Please, with due respect, permit me to say this. I said, I was in charge of initiation. I did this, I did this, I did that, I did that, I did that. I said, but now I'm born again. And I still stand on the grounds that this thing that you are proposing is still wrong. I still said it. I said, because it's not consistent with scriptures. And the pastor was looking at me. He said, who's oh, see. I said, pastor, I I'm not ashamed though that I was not. See, people say some of those things to make you feel ashamed. Sometimes to just put you at a box. No, 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 never be ashamed. It doesn't matter that you have done something wrong. It doesn't matter whether your husband caught you stealing from his wallet. And then he says, you call yourself a Christian, you went to steal from my wallet. This and that. Are you not even ashamed as a husband? You're accusing your wife of stealing from you. It shows the kind of man you are. That you are very, very stiff. Brothers and sisters, do you know that there is a verse in the Bible? We may not have the time to look at that now. It said, Cause is a man who marries a woman that is tight-fisted. For she will bring the family to scarcity. A man, a generous man, who marries a woman who is tight-fisted will bring the family to scarcity. And then the Bible says, Cause is a woman who marries a man who is not a giver. For he will bring the family to want. That means the family will always be in lack. 
So for most of most of you who want to even marry, these are the indices you look at, even in the lives of people before you marry them. The Bible says, "Cause is a woman, cause is a woman who marries a man who is not a giver, for he will bring the family to want. Cause is a man who marries a woman who is tight-fisted, tight-fisted. That means she's." Uh, Maybe the man says, I want to do something. Let me give, like most of you women, maybe the man says he wants to do something for his family. The woman says, no, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> don't worry. That, you see that money that you are trying to protect, it will finish. It will finish. And God cannot tell a lie. Alright, so finally, Sister Kisha, he says here, yeah. now look at verses 14. Sister Kisha, read verses 14 to us. Okay. I'm still on Yes. Yes. Okay, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Did you see that? He said, I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling. Hamasha. Remember, Hamasha. He says, yes, I know I've made mistakes. He said, but I put them behind me. I'm still running my race on my track. Because you see, all those mistakes are trying to derail you. There is a race to... Now, the word press there, that word press, please mark that word press. It is a Greek word that means... The Greek word for that word press means dioko. D-I-A-K-O. Dioko. 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 And dioko means to run in a haste. To run swiftly. To run in a haste. You are not looking back. You are running swiftly. So when he says, I press towards the mark, he's saying, I'm running swiftly towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. And I'm putting my past behind me. Yes, even in the course of the race, I may make mistakes. He said, put it behind you. It doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, it doesn't even matter why you were being a Christian now. You stumbled into a channel and the channel was showing pornography. You, you, and then you, you find yourself, you caught yourself watching it. And then at the end of the day, you say, ah, hey, God, oh, hey, oh, Satan has caught me. No, no, no. He said, put it behind you. Keep running your race. You are still a Christian. You are very much a Christian than the time you started watching the pornography. And brothers and sisters, you see some Christians who come now and see you, see a brother or a sister watching pornography, and they say, ah, you are watching pornography, and you call yourself a Christian. You need to repent, you will go to hell. No, 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 you are drifting into another man's track. Leave him alone. First of all, you are not the one that died for him on the cross. He should be wise enough to know who to apologize to. He should be wise enough to know who to seek forgiveness from. God Almighty. Let him do it between him. Let him do it himself. Don't be the one to remind him. He knows. Someone said, but what if he does not know? Who told you? Were you the one that died for him on the cross? Hey, it was God now. It was God. Because God wanted me to remind him. That's why he made me catch him watching the pornography. <laughs> you are drifting. No. You are drifting. Run your own race. Hamasha. Leave him alone. If he discusses it with you, then you can give him counsel. But if he, not, if he does not bring the matter before you, don't make it your business. Brothers and sisters, there is so much to be happy about. Have you not noticed, ever since you have been nosing into another person's business, you yourself, you have become very unhappy. Have you not even noticed it? You are married to a man who drinks. Leave him alone. Just keep praying for him. And just keep loving God. Make your life attractive. Because you see, the beauty of your life will condemn his sins, will condemn his wrongs. Not you saying a word to him. When he sees the sanctity of your spirit, he can see. I hope you know, sinners can actually see the beauty of God in your life. Sinners can. They can see it. So don't be the one to say, you must be born again. I've been telling you, stop drinking. Ah, I'm your wife. I'm a Christian. I'm a leader in church. I lead prayers. Leave him alone. The more you say that, the more you push him away. Leave him. Just make your life attractive to him. He tells you, ah, madam, do you know what? I took 30, 30 bottles of Guinness. You say, praise God, oh, praise God. Did you enjoy it? Clap for him. Tell him, ah, praise God. I hope you enjoyed it. Amen. What would you like to eat that? Would you like to eat food? Then you find the man say, ah, I told you I drank Guinness. You didn't even criticize me. You didn't query me. He say, ah, no, I can't query you. Why can't you query me? I was not the one that died for you on the cross. It was Jesus who died for you on the cross. Do you know that, may, that statement alone may just be... The thing that will make the difference in his life. The Bible says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in the pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in the pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in the pictures of silver. Praise God. Praise God. Finally, Sister Kisha, go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12. 
We are answering your questions, Sister Kisha. I hope you don't mind. Yes, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm very grateful for confirmation. Yes. Well, um, Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter six, verse twelve. Verse twelve. All right. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Did you see that? It says, Wherefore, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Now, in other words, uh, let it not be that it is by eye service. That it is when I'm there, that's when you start doing it. He said, No, even in my absence right now, because he was writing a letter to them. He said, Even in my absence right now, work out your own salvation. Did you see that? Please mark that expression. Work out your own salvation. How? He says, With fear and trembling. Say that with me, with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. He says, work it out. How? He says, with fear. The word fear there means godly reverence. With godly reverence and trembling, honor. Godly reverence and honor. With fear and trembling. Do you know there are some Christians, they don't fear God at all. When you tell them about God, they say, where is he now? Nah, show us. When did you start this Christianity? I've been there before you. Look at my gray hair. I've been a deacon right for many years. Look at you. They don't fear God, though. He says, no, work out your own. Please mark that word, your own. Your own. He didn't say work out another person's salvation. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Leave your husband alone. Leave your brother alone. Leave your friend alone that is criticizing you. Leave your neighbors. Leave your colleagues at work. He said, he said, work out your own. Brothers and sisters, you know, there are some husbands who deceive themselves, saying that, uh, since my wife is praying for me, it covers me. It is not true. Look at it here. He said, work out your own. So your wife is working out her own salvation. She's not working, she's not doing it for you. So you do your own. And the same thing goes for, the, for some wives. They say, after all, my husband is praying for me now. Ha, you are joking. You are really, really joking. She said, that will give you kobokwe. He will flog you seriously. No, don't do it. Don't do it. He says, work out your own salvation. Did you see that? He said, own. Your own salvation. So leave another person. That is chasing women, always going to Broadway to go and see ladies chasing women, leave him alone. He says, work out your own trial. See, first of all, who even made you a judge over him? Who made you a judge over him? He says, work out your own salvation. He says what? With fear and godly reverence. Godly reverence. With fear and godly reverence. With fear and godly reverence. Yeah? Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, brothers and sisters, any other question? Please tell us your name. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, my, my question is, uh, in fact, we, we are privileged, uh, the Lord is uh, opening our eyes about this, uh, about what thing is meant, and then even to the extent that we learn about a master. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, what my question is, uh, if, for example, you are a new, a born again, and uh, you're looking for somebody of, uh, pastor or a leader who will show you how not to miss the mark and the leader himself miss the mark i hope uh, that will be uh, to make all those who are learning from him miss the mark so who will be blamed in this situation okay sir all right sir thank you sir for that question it's a wonderful wonderful question it's a wonderful and a sensitive question. But let's see something in um, 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Second Timothy. Welcome. On. Second Timothy Chapter 
chapter 2 verses 15 that defense is can you read for us sir Second Timothy chapter 2 verses 15 Second Timothy 2 15 Self approved unto God The first master needed not a shame Rightly dividing the word of truth Did you see that brothers and sisters? He says study to show yourself approved Unto who? Unto God Not unto the pastor it's a study to show yourself approved unto God. So, brothers and sisters, yes, a pastor, see, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that that someone is a pastor does not mean he has grown. The reason why someone is made a pastor is because the person is available. Although a pastor should grow, but that somebody is a pastor doesn't mean he has grown. There are many pastors, even many bishops and archbishops that have not grown at all. They are babies in Christ. You can even hear them. You can hear it even in their language. You can see it even in the way they live their lives. You can see the way they describe Christianity. And they are, they are, they are, you can see it even in their doctrines. The way they use their doctrines to cage people. They catch people from making advancements. So that somebody is a pastor doesn't mean he has grown. That is the reason why the Lord is telling you, you, you study to show your own self approved. Because you see, when you study and you know the word of God for yourself, you will know exactly what to do. You will know exactly what to do. And that's why the Lord is even helping us even in the Bible classes. So that we can actually know these things. So that no, no one pastor or one great minister will not just come and toss you to and fro. No. Now, whether or not, of course, yes, he will be accountable for the sheep. He will be accountable for the sheep that the Lord gave him the privilege to lead. He will be accountable for the sheep that the Lord gave him the privilege to lead. If he's misleading them. But then, you the sheep, you the sheep, should you be misled? Because you also have a part to play. You have a responsibility in the matter. And the responsibility is that God is telling you, you study too. Now, did you notice he didn't say pastors study to show themselves approved? He says study. So it doesn't matter whether you are a pastor or not. Pastor says, most of you will even agree. For those who have been in this class um, since inception, and for those who even joined later, much later, you also realize that most of the things that the Lord is revealing to us, many pastors do not even know them. Many pastors do not know some of these things. But then the Lord is revealing these, these things to us so that we can actually live a better Christian life and show them. You know, we have always thought that um, we are supposed to learn from the pastor, which is true. It is not wrong at all. But then, the pastor also should also learn from you. But you have not thought of that once. So, in as much as the pastor is responsible for you, you are also responsible for the pastor too. Because since the pastor has been living the wrong life, you now live the right life so that he can learn from you. Now, whether he learns from you or not is another subject. And that will be between him and the Lord. You know, um, the pastor I lived with in Nigeria, Pastor Patrick, he, he, he will say to me, he said, oh, see, God brings people your way for two reasons. And he says, number one, he said, the first reason is that God brings people your way to show you the people you should desire to be like. And the second reason is to show you people you should never desire to be like. So these are actually the two main reasons why God brings people your way. Some you should look up to and desire to be like them. Why others you should never, never desire to be like them. So these are the two reasons. Alright. But then, how would you know whether these ones are people you should desire to be like or those you should never desire to be like? The Lord says, study to show yourself approved. Unto who? Unto God. Not even the pastor. He says, unto God. Once God has approved of you, by reason of study, rightly dividing the word of truth, you will never be in shame. You will never be put to shame. And any step you take, by reason of your study, rightly dividing the word of truth, the Lord has, the Lord approves of it. Do you know there are many Christians who take certain steps, and then they are trying to find out whether the Lord really approves of the step they took. That's the, it's easy to know. If only you will give time to the word of God and study, you will be able to know whether the step you want to take is the right step. Because some have even taken the right step 
without God's approval. So because they took the right step without God's approval, it automatically became the wrong step. See that? So as you study the word of God, you see, eating of the fruit was not even the problem with Adam. It was the timing. He didn't wait for God's time. Don't forget, it was God who put that tree there. And the Bible says it was the fruit of the knowledge, good and evil. So it was a fruit tree. It, so that means that it was meant to be eaten. But Adam did not wait for the timing of God. But how do you know these things? Studying the word of God. Studying the word of God. So as you study, the Lord begins to show you. And brothers and sisters, the more you desire to know the word of God and you study in earnest. And the Spirit of God reveals the reality of the word of God to you. Because only the, word, only the Holy Ghost can teach you the word correctly. Because he's the author of the book. Brothers and sisters, if you walk in the light of God's word, in reality, haven't studied, no matter the step you take, it can never be an error. And just because he did not favor others, doesn't mean that the Lord did not approve of it. But when you do what is right, by reason of fear, it means that God has no hand in it. Um, Daddy Francis, I hope we've answered your question. Hello, Daddy Francis. I hope we've answered your question. Hello. Hello, Daddy Francis. That's right, it's answered. Okay, it's answered. thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. All right, any other questions, brothers and sisters? Any other question? We walk in the light, beautiful light, shine all the dew drops of mercies are bright, shine all around us by day and by night, Jesus the light of the world. We walk in the light, beautiful light. We come there, the dew drops of mercies are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. How many of you know this song? We walk in the light. Beautiful light, here comes the dew drops of mercies are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. We walk in the light, beautiful light. Jesus, the light of the world, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. You see, you see, brothers and sisters, we're walking in the light, that beautiful light, where the dew drops of mercies are bright. And that light is shining, shining all around us by day and by night. And that light is Jesus. And Jesus is the light of the world. And anyone who walks in the light of the word of God can never walk in darkness. You always know exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Amen. We walk in the light. Beautiful light. Here comes the dew drops of mercies are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. Brothers and